Um, it's certainly my privilege now to introduce uh, my colleague on the stage here. And uh, last year we decided that we were going to forego introductions, but I think because this is our first one and we may have a number of folks here that have not been to them before, and so I'm going to go ahead to uh, play with your introduction and then we're going to get right into the topic at hand. Uh, Clay Jenkinson is a Rhodes and Danforth scholar, is a published author, and one of the leading public humanities scholars in the United States. He hosts a nationally syndicated radio program from Bismarck, the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and works as a speaker, consultant, and facilitator. Jenkinson directs the Dakota Institute of the Fort Mandan Foundation and serves on its board. He is chief consultant to the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University, the, di di excuse me, the distinguished scholar of the humanities at Bismarck State College, and a columnist for the Bismarck Tribune. He is also an award-winning filmmaker, researching, writing, and participating in documentary films about notable North Dakotans. Jenkinson has an MA from Oxford University, England, a BA in English Literature from Vanderbilt University, and a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. Clay was born in Minot and raised in Dickinson, so please welcome Clay Jenkinson to our stage. And Clay has been doing many things, uh, in fact, just got back from Arizona, uh, but you've got a number of events coming up and we thought we'd start off with yeah, those. I don't, want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I, there was a handout that you can get, and if you didn't get it, you can get it when we leave, but two really important things coming up right now. In Dickinson, starting this coming Thursday, Thursday the 16th, uh, our fifth annual uh, Public Humanities Symposium on Theodore Roosevelt, and the theme this year is Theodore Roosevelt, the president in the arena. Each year it's Theodore Roosevelt, the something in the arena, the adventurer, the conservationist, the family man, and this, our fifth um, such symposium is, is Roosevelt, the president in the arena, and all the events are free. There's a registration fee if you want to go to the banquet and hear the musical program and the field trip and so on, but all the lectures and panels are free, so if you're interested in Roosevelt, do consider coming out this weekend. Uh, as you can imagine, the weather won't continue like this forever, and going out on Saturday morning to Medora is just such a wonderful experience. We have hikes in the park and so on and so forth. So that's coming up this week. It's funded uh, in part by the North Dakota Humanities Council, and then the big, 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 big thing that the Dakota Institute and the Humanities Council and BSC are doing as partners is our um, national symposium on Eric Severide coming up at the end of the month. It's September 30th, which is a Thursday, and then October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Um, it's unbelievable what's happening here. We wanted to do something really special for Eric Severide, and um, Brenna Doherty has taken the lead on making the contacts with these people, but everyone we have asked has said yes, Larry, because Dan Rather wants to come because he's so revered his mentor, Eric Severide, and Bob Schieffer wants to come because he believes that Severide was one of the central figures in the history of broadcast, and Nick Clooney, and Bob Edwards of NPR, now of Sirius Satellite Radio, and so on and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's an all-star cast, and it's Thursday night, the 30th of September, and then Friday the 1st, Saturday the 2nd, and on Sunday we're going to take a field trip up to Severide's Velva. But this is, I have to say, I think this is the most impressive public humanities event in my lifetime in North Dakota. I'm just shocked at how many really remarkable people are coming from long distances because they so respect and revere uh, Eric Severide. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a movie on uh, We're, Severide as well. A documentary film. I brought you a copy, by the way, of our last documentary on Bill Guy, but we're, the Dakota Institute's doing a documentary on Severide. We're partnering with Prairie Public, and it'll be nationally broadcast in 2012. 2012 will be the centennial of Severide's birth. He was born in Velva, North Dakota in November of 1912, and we're going to have a documentary film. We've already interviewed Dan Rather, um, Charles Osgood, Rita Braver, and Tom Brokaw. Um, and we had five hours with Dan Rather in New York. It was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever had. You've seen it at a marvelous time. And then we have a, a whole list of people we'll be interviewing while they're here for the symposium, and that film will come out in, in sometime in the spring of 2012. Okay. Well, we certainly appreciate what you've done in the documentary films, uh, uh, the one on Art Link, and now the one on Bill Guy, and now Eric Severide. Who's going to be next? Well, we're doing, uh, and I should just say, we will get to the topic here, I hope. But, <laughs> um, I bring you greetings today from Shyla Schaefer. Shyla Schaefer, some of you know, most of you I'm sure know, 
Uh, she's ill right now and in med center, um, recovering from a little surgery, surgery that she had last week. She, she's never missed one of these talks. We just called her just before we started, and she sends her greetings. But we're doing a film, the Dakota Institute is doing a film on the Schaefers. Uh, Harold Schaefer, Shyla Schaefer, Governor Ed Schaefer, First Lady Nancy Schaefer, and then other Schaefers. Um, and it'll be really a very unusual film about this extraordinary family. You know, you've, you've heard all of your life about what Harold Schaefer did for Medora and so on, but that's not our theme. Our theme is that they're all amazing, whimsical, heavy talkers. The Schaefers are, uh, you, there isn't a Schaefer who's not interesting. I've interviewed Shyla now for 35 hours, and it's like interviewing as a contact sport, Larry. Um, <laughs> She, she is, I mean, she's simply the most, um, how do you say, um, effervescent person I've ever known in my life. And she can entertain. She was entertaining in the hospital yesterday. The <laughs> nurses come in just to listen to her stories. So we're doing this film about Harold and Shyla, and Harold's first wife, too, and then Governor Schaefer, who's had a very interesting and remarkable life, and that film will, will come out in 2012. And he now has a daughter in this administration. Governor Schaefer has a daughter named Ellie, who is, works for the Obama White House. She's a Obamaite. Yeah. I don't know if Harold would have liked that. <laughs> uh, and she works as a scheduler inside the, the, um, the Obama White House and is on close personal terms with um, Michelle and Barack Obama, and she's, and she's, so she's not, she's not a Schaeferite in quite the same sense. Yeah. Well, that'll be interesting. So, uh, but we will get to the topic. One of the first things we talked about doing here, and I've got a stack of books laying around me, and this is our one and only presentation that we're giving uh, on Lewis and Clark, although it really is as the, the slide shows the mysterious death of Meriwether Lewis. And the rest of our presentations you can see in the, uh, in the pamphlet that you picked up, hopefully, on your way in. And uh, I would ask you to take a look at those. But you can see that uh, the topic of Lewis and Clark is going to happen once, and, and that's going on right now. So what I thought I would do is sort of go from the macro down to the micro, and then we'll get right into the topic here. But about uh, Lewis and Clark in general, if I, I don't think there's, Clay, you say if you disagree with me here, I don't think there's any book that has done more to popularize Lewis and Clark than Stephen Ambrose's Undaunted Courage. Um, if, if you're interested in Lewis and Clark, uh, Ambrose's book is, is absolutely excellent, and I'm sure a number of the folks in here have already read that, and certainly when we were having the celebration here in North Dakota not that long ago. You know, Larry, but, I fly all, all the time all over the country, and I don't think I've been on an airplane since 2001 in which somebody wasn't reading Undaunted Courage. Yeah. It's like, I've never seen a book that has that much range across the public. Yeah. But if there's one book, if you're just gonna read one book on Lewis and Clark, my personal favorite, and I, and I think Clay would agree with me too, is James uh, Rhonda's book, Lewis and Clark Among the Indians. Um, we've gotta remember that Lewis and Clark and, and the rest of the expedition were really foreigners traveling into other nations, if you will, and the other nations were the Indian nations that they were traveling to. And James Ronda has just done a remarkable job of telling that story of, of their interaction with the, with the native peoples as they traveled on the, the core of discovery. And so if you're going to read one, I would read this one on, on, uh, by James Ronda. Well, what, he, what he did was just turn the lens. You know, for 200 years, we've looked at the story from the, through the eyes of Jefferson and Lewis and Clark and white explorers. And, Rhonda, who is an who's, who's a eminent historian at the University of Tulsa, simply said, what if you turned the lens and looked at this story from the Native American point of view? Would you see it, what would you see differently? And it turns out it's quite a different, quite a different story, story. When, you, when, you, yeah. when you turn the lens around. And then speaking of lens, if you focus just on North Dakota, I would recommend uh, this by our own, actually uh, edited and with an introduction by Clay Jenkinson, forward by James Rhonda, is A Vast and Open Plain, which I'll let you talk about. Well, this was done with, by the State Historical Society of North Dakota for the bicentennial, and I'm a, just immensely proud of this book. Uh, here's why it's in, inter, important, I think. Lewis and Clark spent more time in North Dakota than in any other state. Uh, 
their, the heart of their experience really was North Dakota and Montana, but there was more North Dakota activity than there was Montana activity, and it was in North Dakota that they had their most successful relations with Native peoples. They did their most um, considerable anthropological studies of Native peoples. Uh, it's here that they launched into the true wilderness, leaving Fort Mandan on April 7, 1805. It's here that Lewis wrote the only book that he would ever write, this will come up later, but he wrote a long report to the president, which he sent down river with the keel boat in the spring of 1805. That book, his report, it's called the Mandan Miscellany, is reproduced at the end of this book. But here's why it's really important. What we did was something that's obvious but revolutionary. Most editions of Lewis and Clark have Lewis and Clark, the two captains, journals. And then at the end, after volume 11, they have the other journal keepers, uh, Joseph Whitehouse, John Ordway, and Patrick Gass. And so if you want to read about what happened on the day that Sacagawea first came to Fort Mandan, you can read Lewis and Clark's account of it, but then if, in typical journals, you have to go somewhere else if you want to read the others. What we've done is put every journal writer in every day on the day that he wrote so that you can read Lewis, Clark, Gas, Ordway, White House, and what you get is very different views of the same set of experiences. So this book has great value in that it re-knits together this story. And why that wasn't done by the University of Nebraska edition, I don't know, but we're justly proud of, of that. Then, then there's the two individuals, that, Lewis and Clark, and uh, my personal favorite on Clark is The Wilderness Journey by William Foley, and do uh, you have any thoughts you want to... He's a great... I mean, th there are three new biographies of Clark. This is by far and away the best of them. So if you're going to read about William Clark, I would recommend this book. And uh, this is one you recommended on Meriwether Lewis. There, there are three, basically three biographies of Lewis. Uh, Stephen Ambrose's book was, is essentially a biography of Lewis. Uh, then there was a, a Richard Dillon in the 1950s who wrote a biography of Lewis. And then there hasn't been a, a, a really... A, a good biography of Lewis um, ever, really, not a definitive one, and, and unfortunately this isn't it either, but, uh, but it's an interesting book. It's Thomas Denisi and John Jackson, and, and they have concentrated, they're heavily indebted to Bill Foley, they've concentrated on Lewis's life after the expedition. And there's a very controversial final chapter that we'll come back to later, but this is a good book to read about everything except the journey for Lewis. And then, uh, Another personal favorite of mine, the character of Meriwether Lewis uh, that David was talking about. This was the original one you published 10 years ago? Yeah, about eight, and, yeah. And then uh, that's being redone by, the, by Fort Mandan. Um, and so we'll, we're really going to get into this one heavily we are. today. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Then the last one, which really brings us to the topic. See, we went from the macro to, down to the micro here, which really brings us to the topic is by his own hand with a question mark, uh, the mysterious death of Meriwether Lewis. And that brings us then to the topic of the day. So we're gonna try to focus in on, on uh, Meriwether Lewis uh, today and uh, see where we go with that. So uh, Clay's gonna start off with some opening comments and then we'll get into a little- Well, let me just back up, uh, Larry, about Lewis. I mean, what, just to get a few facts on the table about Lewis. Meriwether Lewis was born on August 18, 1774, within sight of Monticello. Jefferson was a friend of Lewis's parents, William Lewis and um, Lucy Marks. And Lewis was young enough to be Jefferson's son. Jefferson had no ch sons. And Lewis's father died when Lewis was four or five years old. And so there's kind of a father-son relationship that occurred between Meriwether Lewis and Thomas Jefferson. Lewis, from his childhood, was a sort of a wilderness guy and a wanderer, and Jefferson later said he was habituated to the woods from the age of eight. He was a natural rambler, and that he had uh, this tremendous set of wilderness skills, um, courage, resourcefulness, stamina, uh, an iron physical um, strength, and so on. Lewis then applied, Jefferson is always trying to get this trip going, it wasn't until 1803 that he was able to do it. Lewis applied at the age of 18 to accompany a Frenchman who was going to make a trip into the West, and Jefferson regarded him as too young. 
So when Jefferson becomes president in, in March of 181, he's still thinking, I'll get this journey finally, now I can do it because I'm president. And he hires Lewis out of the army to come to Washington, the new federal capital, to serve as Jefferson's private correspondence secretary. And Lewis lives with Thomas Jefferson in the White House for a little over two years. And then in um, 1803, on the 4th of July, Lewis leaves Washington and goes out to handle this journey. Jefferson chose Lewis. Lewis, in turn, chose Clark. Jefferson did not choose Clark. Jefferson knew of the Clark family and was a great admirer of Clark's older brother, George Rogers Clark. But Jefferson really had in mind a single commander. And it was Lewis's decision that the trip was going to be so complex and arduous that there needed to be a second near equal in command. And he then hired an old friend of his, William Clark. So that's the sort of setup to the story. On that point, you make, uh, uh, it's almost comical that if he hadn't been a drinker, he would have never ended up meeting Clark. And that's how the, this relationship, can you explain that? Well, first of all, I should say that back then, drinking was uh, ubiquitous. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, a famous book called The Alcoholic Republic about the early national period and how much drinking went on. People drank much, much more then than they drink today, partly because water treatment plants didn't yet exist. and. There were a whole reason for this, but it was a much heavier drinking period than, than the Army is today. And Lewis, unfortunately, had an alcohol problem from an early age. And I suppose we would say he was an alcoholic. And so he drank heavily. And when he was in the Army, he got into a, a near duel with a man. And there was a court-martial, and Lewis was exonerated. But after the court-martial, Mad Anthony Wayne got Lewis re assigned to a different company to get him out of, out of this place where all this trouble had been. And the company to which Lewis was reassigned was a, was a select rifle company that was commanded by none other than William Clark. And so William Clark is just minding his own business in 1795 in the Army, and suddenly this, this troublemaker is assigned to him from somewhere else with a drinking problem. And so the point is, from the very beginning, Lewis and Clark had a relationship that was not untroubled. That Lewis had come after a scandal. It was clear that he had a problem. He winds up in Clark's company. Clark is his commander. You know, just let me digress for one second on William Clark. There's, there are many fundamental differences between Lewis and Clark. I mean, Stephen Ambrose liked to call them the best friends in American history and that they were sort of Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and that's, that's not true at all, really. They're very, very different human beings. And Clark was a very stable man all of his life, and Lewis was an unstable man most of his life. And Clark had already gotten into this pattern because he had spent the last five or six years before the expedition cleaning up after his older famous brother, George Rogers Clark. George Rogers Clark was a very important figure in the American Revolution, particularly in the Old Northwest. But he had a very severe drinking problem, and he got into all sorts of legal entanglements over land and debt, and he never got paid by the government, and he was constantly suing and petitioning. And his affairs were just a mess. And William Clark, his younger brother, resigned his commission in the Army and went home to try to sort all of this out and to try to manage his brother's problems, his brother's drinking, his, his brother's rages, his brother's melancholic fits. And so Clark seems to be that man, that he's always cleaning up after a more famous troubled partner or friend or brother. And so he did this first for his brother, and then he did this for Meriwether Lewis, and then after Meriwether Lewis's death in 1809, Clark had not, Clark wasn't, one of the people assigned to write the book. The book was to be written by Lewis. Lewis dies. Jefferson gets Lewis's papers. Jefferson looks through them and says, there's no book here. Where's the book? And so he calls in Clark and says, it's up to you now to take care of this. And poor Clark now has to go in. I mean, he literally didn't know what artists Lewis had hired to illustrate. He didn't know any secretaries or amanuenses or researchers. He didn't know what scientists Lewis had uh, 
had assigned to classify the plants and the minerals and, and the animal specimens, he had to go to Philadelphia, Clark did, and sort of wander around saying, do you know anything about Lewis's book? And so he had then to bail Lewis out one more time to do something that he was not eager to do and, and frankly not fitted to do, to publish the report of the expedition. He got it done and it was finally published in 1814. But Clark spent his whole life cleaning up after people. And so I always say when I talk about this that the smartest decision that Lewis ever made in the whole course of his life was to hire William Clark. And I think it's fair to say that if Lewis had not chosen someone like Clark, it's not clear that the expedition would have succeeded. Lewis is a very high-strung, uh, tightly wound, uh, easily upset, um, prone to moods and fits of depression sort of person. And whether he would have been able to hold it together without Clark there to um, calm him down and prop him up and take care of things that Lewis didn't get done, including the journal, is an open question. So this relationship is a very dense one and fraught with tensions that, that, that we kind of forget when we talk about Lewis and Clark as if they're just two guys. Yeah. As I'm listening to Clay, I'm reminded the other day we had a disagreement over Lewis and Clark. We did? Yep. Yeah. So I was saying this, Clay's saying that, I say, I disagree with you. Clay says, oh, I defer to you, O Lewis and Clark scholar. Yeah. So I had to say, okay, uncle, no. I, I agree. Well, what were we disagreeing no. about? The forts, what oh, the, the forts fort. looked like. Okay, great. I was obviously yeah. wrong. Really, you were wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, go ahead. Okay, well, let's, let's do this. The, the, Look let's at a, a few things. We've does, laid that, the does that cover the ground yep, on the background That covers the ground, that's the background. I, I'm sure everybody in here is pretty familiar with the overall story, and now you've given us some details. Now let's go but, into this. But wait a minute. Okay. Let me just say one thing about this. I was, I, I, the other night I was, I, I was, I had just gotten back from a trip, and I was, I was sitting in uh, this restaurant, and I was having a beer and reading about Lewis's death, and you know, I sometimes do at night go to a, like a restaurant and have a beer and read. You and I sometimes gather together to do this. I have water. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine, Larry. <laughs> and so this, there's this guy about two seats away from me and he's intoxicated and he has, he's working in the oil patch and he has tattoos everywhere. And so he looks over and he says, so are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> Which is always a bad question because, you know, you are reading, but now you're not. And so I said yes, and he said, well, what are you reading? And I said, well, I tried to, you know, mind my own business, but eventually he, he said, what's that book? And so I held up this book about the death of Lewis, and he said, oh, I just read a book by a guy named Ambrose. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> uh, and he said, this is it. He said, he, but here's why this is interesting. He said, I was reading along, and they're like, they're killing grizzly bears, and they're meeting Indians, and they're discovering things, and they're crossing the continent, and there's a woman and a child. And he said, it's the most amazing story I ever read. I'm just fascinated by this. But then he said, but in the end, did you, did you expect that Lewis was going to kill himself? He said, when I read that, I didn't believe it. He said, I was just shocked by that. So that's really important, because... This, was, this is what you're always looking for, a fresh reader. You know, he, he doesn't know this whole story. Do you rem I remember when I, the moment that I first learned that Lewis had killed himself, I was reading a book by David Freeman Hawk called Those Tremendous Mountains, and I knew a little bit about Lewis and Clark, but not much, and you get to this and you realize, whoa, Meriwether Lewis committed suicide. That is a very wild ending to this story. And so this was, it was a fun encounter. He said he was coming. I don't know that he did but, uh, today, but, but he had read this book and he said he was going to get this one and that he, was, he wanted to figure out, he said, if you guys can figure out why he committed suicide, I'll be really happy. So that's your job, Larry. Now that you've called him intoxicated, I hope he's not sitting out here. Is he? Okay, anyway. All right. He was intoxicated. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we've been there. Been there. There's the route, of course. Anything you want to say? Just that it's a, you know, uh, 
it's truly a transcontinental journey. It, whether it began at Philadelphia or Washington, D.C. or Charlottesville is an open question, but before Lewis started up the Missouri River, he had to go down the Ohio River, and the keelboat, which was last seen in North Dakota and then turned back in April of 1805, the keelboat was manufactured in Pittsburgh, and, and Lewis had to go all the way down the Ohio to get to his staging point, which was St. Louis. There he is. Now there's the difference between the two characters, Larry, the mercurial Lewis and the always reliable, down-to-earth, sandy-haired Clark. <laughs> Can you believe that? Don't you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what are the, you know, so let's just think about this. All right, so first of all, what actually happened? We're going to go through that. What happened in October of 189? Because we'll, we'll get to some things that we know for sure. And one of them is that Lewis died. Nobody doubts this. There isn't a single person who doubts this. Meriwether Lewis died on October 11th, 189, about 70 miles from Nashville, Tennessee, on the Natchez Trace. And so the question then is, you know, what, how can we establish, it's, it's, it's trying to try to draw the distinction between the humanities and history. So history wants to establish what happened. And I think we, do you agree, we can reasonably reconstruct what happened? Or, do, or don't you agree? Well, if, if you say that he died on that night, we can reasonably accept that. And that he fact. died of gunshot wounds. And gunshot and so wounds, okay. fact. So, so we know that he didn't, this isn't like Elvis, that he turned up in a liquor store and right. you know, somewhere else a year later. Right. And so then the question is, why did it happen? That's, a, in, that's an, an unanswerable question, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. What does it signify? You know, it's, I guess in a certain way, it's, the most, it's one of the most famous um, death stories in American history. There are, it continues to fascinate, to trouble, to create controversy. David Borlaug and the, and the staff of the Fort Mandan Foundation and I were at the bicentennial final event in, um, on the Natchez Trace two years ago, in, well, it was a year ago, on October um, 18, or 2009, at the place you'll see some slides of it, and I was one of the moderators of this national event we had and we had, we went over this for like three days. What happened to Lewis? Was it murder or suicide? What does it signify? And I can tell you that there is still, you can get into a shouting match over whether it was suicide or murder at these national meetings. There is still intense controversy about what exactly happened and what it signifies. So this isn't like the death of Abraham Lincoln where we know what happened, there's not, there's no mystery. We, we know a lot about John Wilkes Booth and the conspirators. We know how it happened. We're sure that Lincoln was killed that night and so on. We know where he's buried. That's not true of this story. This story is just fraught with anxiety and controversy. And so what does it signify? It, we wouldn't be talking about this. Unless, I mean, partly we talk about this because we're fascinated by Lewis and Clark, but, but, but the reason I'm interested in it is it raises questions about why Jefferson chose Lewis. Was, did something happen on the journey that, was, that has to be factored in here? Does it say something about his encounters with the wilderness, his encounters with native peoples, his encounters with himself? Those are really interesting questions. So why do we care? And then why is there controversy? Well, the controversy will come we'll spend some time on, but the controversy really is, uh, was he murdered or did he commit suicide? And even though, I think you'll agree, having read all this stuff, that the overwhelming majority of the evidence points to suicide, um, there are lots and lots of people who refuse to accept that and believe that the murder theory, which didn't really start getting into the discourse until 45 years later, um, has some kind of historical validity, and so why that should matter. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? At the time it happened, did anybody say it was murder? No, when, when, the, when this, so, so let's go to here, let's move forward to here's what we know. Okay. Just a couple down here. Go beyond that. Come back, go beyond that. Okay. We know that he died on October 11, 189. There's an absolutely no doubt about that. We know that he died of gunshot wounds to the head and the abdomen and maybe 
had knife or razor cuts on his body. No one doubts that. We know that there were no eyewitnesses. Um, Lewis is dead. He's the only person who was in a position to see unless he was murdered. But if the murderer, if he was murdered, the murderer is an eyewitness that has never been uncovered. And, and no one has ever determined who the murderer might have been. There were several near eyewitnesses. Mrs. Grinder, who ran the, the little hotel that he was at, his free black servant, Pernier, um, a man he was traveling with who was a U.S. Indian agent by the name of James Neely. There were some near eyewitnesses who were staying on the estate and heard shots, but they were not witnesses to the actual event. Go ahead and go on. Um, we know that Lewis was under great physical stress and mental stress. His physical stress had to do with malaria. Uh, he had advanced, um, advanced stages of malaria, which can produce excruciating pain and derangement. And, and, and the word derangement comes up in virtually every account or observation of Lewis during that last year of his life. Derangement's the key word that every respondent, every observer seems to come to. He also was um, taking, he was an alcoholic, he was severely drinking. He was also taking laudanum at this time, which was a, is, is an opium derivative, it's like morphine, and he was maybe addicted to laudanum. And so his, his, his mental state is clouded by physical toxicity. He's also, and the setup to all of this, the key fact of this is that Lewis was the governor of Upper Louisiana. So one of the payoffs for the expedition was that Jefferson appointed him to be the first governor of Upper Louisiana, stationed in St. Louis. Lewis had a terrible time being governor. And he was responsible for spending a lot of money in the territory and then sending in his vouchers after the fact to the War Department to get them reimbursed. This is a really bad way to run a territory, but as you know, that's how it was done. And so Lewis was making a lot of financial decisions, and then afterwards, usually with long delays, sending in his accounts, and eventually the War Department started to challenge his vouchers. And at the end of the last days of his life, between mid-August of 189 and October, he was under investigation by the War Department, and they were actually openly contemptuous of some of his business affairs, and they had refused to um, reimburse some vouchers, and that put him personally into a terrible economic financial crisis. He was effectively on the brink of personal economic collapse and bankruptcy. And he also felt that the War Department was doubting his integrity, and that Integrity mattered in that age much more than it does now, but it mattered to people like Lewis in a gigantic way. And so he was mentally uh, all stirred up from this, this set of events that had occurred. So he's physically ill, he's mentally ill, he's an alcoholic, he's a mess in, in the summer of, of 189. Let's just stop for a second on that point. Do you agree, I think it's Ambrose that says that um, Jefferson was wrong to even appoint him as governor because one, he, now he had to govern this territory, but two, then he was expecting him to write this book to put together these journals and to make all this and that Lewis just wasn't up to it and Jefferson should have known that. Well, yes and no. In retrospect, that seems obvious. That what, I mean, Ambrose says that what Jefferson should have done is keep Lewis in Washington, get him a a secretary or an amanuensis or a, a literary handler, and that Lewis should then sit down with that person and work up the book and publish it, and then and only then would the next stage of his life begin. That's easy to say in retrospect. Jefferson wanted to reward Lewis, and so he gave both of them a reward. Clark became a superintendent of Indian Affairs and a U.S. trade agent in, in Missouri in the upper Louisiana Territory, and Lewis and a brigadier general in the militia, and Lewis became the governor. So these were rewards. And it's not too crazy to think, you know, now we, it, se it seems irrational for us to say this now, but at the time, Lewis was a national hero. He was an extraordinarily talented person. He had obvious leadership capacities. He had a national reputation. It's not inconceivable that Jefferson was grooming him for something really big, like being a senator or possibly even being the president of the United States. I mean, this has happened to other people. Custer had this fantasy. Grant becomes president. Eisenhower. 
if Lewis had been stable and if Lewis had handled his first assignment really well, he might have had a stellar career, the rising to the level of James Monroe or someone of that sort. So Jefferson was trying to do him a favor. And, and the third thing to keep in mind about this is this is the problem with Thomas Jefferson. He's a genius, he's America's da Vinci, but and he made a fatal mistake all of his life. He assumed that everyone he, know, he knew could be kind of a little Jefferson, that they, they too could write a book any time they wanted, and they too could write letters all day, every day, and they too could have a, read all the books and so on. He, he never assumed that anyone was less capable than himself. And we now know that everyone was less capable than he was, and Lewis was a basket case. And so he should have recognized this guy has some issues. So you agree with Ambrose then? Well, I should have recognized uh, it, Yes. Okay. Is that all you wanted? Was it yes or no? <laughs> no. Sorry. No. Sorry. Okay. So one of the things that's interesting about Lewis is that he comes back. They both come back in 1806. They arrive in St. Louis on September 23rd, 1806. Clark has, has a girlfriend named Julia Hancock back at Fincastle, Virginia, she's 14, um, and he marries her within a year. The minute well, he, let's start off, they, they knew each other before he ever left. Right. Right. He knew her when she was 13. Okay. You know, but so, so he comes, you know, he, he comes back from this journey, and, he, and within a year he marries. Lewis comes back from this journey, he never marries, and not being able to find a, a wife is an issue with Lewis, and, and he talks about it in his letters. And he, he actually paid court to a number of different women, and it never worked out. One woman left town to avoid him. I mean, there, there's something, we don't know what this mystery is all about, but, but the point is that Meriwether Lewis should have been able to find a wife. Neil Armstrong can find a wife. Lance Armstrong can find a wife. Anyone who gets to that prominence if he wants to, can find a woman somewhere who's going to be at least uh, impressed by the celebrity. He never marries, and he becomes frustrated by this, that somehow he can't bond with a woman. And we don't know what this means, but it, it certainly means something. And so he says, he's, he's been courting a number of women, they all have turned him down, and then he says in a letter to Clark, whence it comes, I know not, but certain it is that I never felt less like a hero then at the present moment, what may be my next adventure, God knows, but I am determined to get a wife. He also, in a similar letter right in this period, says that he is nothing more than a musty, fusty, rusty old bachelor. At 32. Well, the life expectancy was lower then. This is the famous, there are two famous portraits of Lewis. This is one of them. This is painted by a, a famous French uh, physiognomist um, after Lewis returned, and, and this is the, you know, we, there was no photography in those days, Larry, so uh, if you wanted to be immortalized, you had to, you know, in a photograph, if I took a picture of you right now, I could put it on Facebook while we sit here. In that era, you had to be painted, and to be painted took hours or days or weeks, and so you had to choose how you wanted to be painted. This is how Lewis chose to be painted. He's wearing a tippet, this, this, um, the robe that he's wearing over his shoulders was given to him by Kamiyawait, the Shoshone, out in, on the Idaho-Montana border. Um, a, it's, in a key, it's from a key passage in the journals, but you know, Lewis did not choose to be painted in his military regalia. He might have. Lewis did not choose to be painted in a gentleman's costume, the kind that Jefferson would wear as president. He chose to be painted in this sort of frontier manner, it's, it's, you know, we take this painting for granted. It's a beautiful painting. It's my favorite image of Lewis, but it's odd. This is an odd way to immortalize yourself. He's immortalizing himself way off the, the map of the known world, wearing a Native American's tippet that he loved and a hat. And the, and the only tokens of his being a civilized man, I'm using that term, um, advisedly, or his rifle and his powder horn. But other than that, as he says in a key passage, he's become metamorphosed like a Native American. Don't you find that an interesting way to paint well, yourself? I would ask 
right now, do we want to talk about how we ended up with this, or uh, are we going to talk about that no, later? No, let's just go Because that's really important. This is the whole point of your book. Well, we, well, but let's go forward, because we want to get to his... Okay. Let's get him to Grinder's stand. All right, if we forget to tell you about the tippet and how he got it and why that's so important to Clay Jenkinson, somebody's got to remind me, okay? We've got to get to it. Yeah, okay. yeah we've got to get to it. So I, I just did this to show you the disintegrating nature of Lewis after the expedition. Look at, I mean, he's pixelating right out of existence here. <laughs> but this is what happened to him. His sense of core identity was troubled somehow on the expedition, and he came back, and he, couldn't, he could never re-enter. He had re-entry issues, and he could never go back. You know, Clark was able to re-enter quite successfully. He married, he had children, he held a, his job, he got his vouchers reimbursed routinely. He did everything that he was required to do for the rest of his life, and as you know from your own research as a historian, he became one of the key Indian agents and superintendents of the 19th century. So he had, a, by any measure, a highly successful life and an extremely successful post-expeditionary life. Lewis did not. So there's a fundamental difference there in their re-entries. And Lewis really did come apart. Well, this is when David and, and Borlaug and I and others were at the recreation. This is in Olive Branch, um, well, this is actually at, on, on, the, on the Natchez Trace, but the meeting was held in Olive Branch, Mississippi. This is a recreation of the hut grinder's stand where Lewis, uh, the place where Lewis died. This is the recreated hut. There are Lewis and Clark types. Okay, now let's get to the map. Let's just quickly sh walk through this. this. I'm sorry this map is a little irresolute, but it was the best one I could find. What happened was that he's stationed in St. Louis, and he decides to go to Washington because of this whole voucher investigation and so on. He decides that he can't handle this by correspondence, that he has to go to D.C. and Charlottesville. And remember, Jefferson's no longer the president of the United States. Jefferson is now in retirement, and Madison is the president of the United States. And so Lewis starts in St. Louis, and he's going to go on a boat. His plan is to take a boat all the way to the mouth of the Mississippi and then go on a ship around Florida and up to the Chesapeake and to Washington, D.C. For some reason, in the course of his journey from St. Louis down the Mississippi, he changes his mind and decides to go overland to Washington, D.C. instead. Um, it's a long and interesting story, but we'll just leave it at that for the moment. So he gets a boat from St. Louis, and he leaves for Fort Pickering. He's going to go to today's Memphis, and at today's Memphis, he's going to start his overland journey to intersect the Natchez Trace, which was an early national highway, and then go to Nashville, and then over the old Cumberland Gap to Virginia and up to Washington. So, ne next slide. So he, here he starts on, he's been in, the, the letter that kind of broke his spirit from the War Department came on his birthday, August 18th, 1809. And so less than what, three weeks later, um, he leaves on this little, sh this little boat from St. Louis towards New Orleans. On September 11th, he stops at New Madrid, and there he writes his last will and testament. And a letter to... And a letter to Clark, which has been lost, but which is a very important letter. We'll come back to that. Okay. Then he gets to Fort Pickering on September 15th, four days later. Um, the, the boatmen who have been bringing this distinguished governor, and be like the governor of Montana, or the governor of North Dakota, or the governor of Mississippi, the boatmen who have been bringing him down river from St. Louis to Memphis say that twice on board that journey from September 4th until September 15th, Lewis has attempted to commit suicide once almost successfully. We don't know any more details of it than that, but that's what the Cap Captain Gilbert Russell was told when Lewis landed. There's Fort Pickering at Memphis. On September 15th, he gets to Fort Pickering, and his old army friend, Gilbert Russell, Captain Gilbert Russell, the commander of the fort, immediately puts him under house arrest because he sees that Lewis is deranged and drunk and toxic from probably poisoning of laudanum and alcohol, and that he has, and he has this report that he's attempted to commit suicide. So he puts him under house arrest and dries him out effectively and gives him a little white wine and a little port, but doesn't allow him to drink heavily. And in two weeks, Lewis comes out of whatever toxicity he was in and, and is, appears to be recovered and tells Gilbert Russell, 
that he realizes he has an alcohol problem and he will never drink again. Did it work? That almost never works, the never drink again. But he realized he had an alcohol problem. So while he's there, he writes a letter to, a famous letter to President Madison, the new president. And in that letter, it's, we'll show, I, the next slide might have it. There's a facsimile of it. There are all sorts of chaotic crossings out, and it's, 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 an, it's a somewhat incoherent letter. But the gist of it is, when I get to Washington, I'll be able to prove to you and the War Department that my vouchers are fine, that I'm an honorable man, that this, this whole shadow of doubt that's being cast over me as an administrator has been unfair and mean-spirited. And he says, in a famous line, he says, although you can ruin me financially, you can never, quote, make a burr of me. And what he's referring to there is the Aaron Burr treason. Burr, Jefferson's vice president, was involved in treasonous activities in the West. And Lewis is basically saying, you can treat me as badly as you want, but you'll never drive me into rebellion. You'll never make me disloyal to this country. And so that letter is sent on September 16th. Um, on September 22nd, he writes to another old friend, this is only important because of the problem of Lewis's silences. In my opinion, the chief reason why his life fell apart is that he failed to communicate on a timely basis with important people, including his patron, Jefferson. So he writes to an old friend, Amos Stoddard, wanting to borrow some money, and he says, oh, and I'm sorry I haven't written, responded to your letters over the last three years. Uh, September 29th, he's now dried out, and, and he, he has a kind of a chance encounter with this Captain James Neely, who's an Indian agent to the Chickasaw, and Neely's heading to Nashville, and so Captain Lewis or Governor Lewis and Captain Neely and a couple of others set off together to travel the road um, as a convoy, and Gilbert Russell feels that this Neely will be able to monitor Lewis's drinking and so on. Uh, they go overland on this Indian trail that you can see. They, they leave um, the river, and they go overland on the Indian trail that, to, to intercept the Natchez Trace. They reach the Natchez Trace at um, Chickasaw Agency on October 6th. Uh, now it's just five days before his death. And here's the sad, horrible thing. On that journey from the 29th of September, somewhere between that and the 6th of October, Lewis started drinking heavily again. And Gilbert later says his resolution left him and he descended back into severe alcoholism. They reached the Tennessee River on the 8th of October. On the 10th of October, some of the horses have been lost, so Neely and Lewis's free black servant, Pernier, stay behind to try to get them. Lewis decides to go on alone to the nearest hotel, the nearest roadside stand. He approaches Grinders Inn around 6 p.m. on October 10th, 189, and asks for a room. Mrs. Grinder, Priscilla Grinder, is in her 30s. She and her husband run this sort of bed and breakfast, this frontier hotel. She's kind of freaked out by Lewis but she knows he's a governor and a distinguished man and a famous man. And so she says to him, you're welcome here, governor. Um, I'll vacate the house, you can have the house, which was very common in that era. I'll make you up a bed. And then Lewis says the craziest thing ever said. Remember now, it, he's been home for three years. He says to her, madam, I do not intend to sleep in a bed. I have not slept in a bed since my late tour. So he's been home from the famous journey since September 23, 1806. It's now October 189. And if he's telling the truth, he has, as the governor of Upper Louisiana, he's not been sleeping in a bed. I mean, if we found out that Governor Hoven didn't sleep in a bed, we'd be perplexed. You know, we'd say, this is, remember when Jerry Brown back in California did this kind of stuff? I mean, people were, thought he was insane. Anyway, Lewis tells Mrs. Grinder he doesn't need a bed because he doesn't sleep in a bed. So she, they put down robes on the floor. And then sometime that night, the fatal shooting occurs. So that gives you a sense. Here's, you can see Grinder's stand up here. You, you see the Natchez Trace had lots of little hotels on it. They're basically people's huts, people's private cabins. <coughs> 
This is back to the bicentennial. That's the cabin. That's a statue of Lewis. That's the grave marker in, um, on the Natchez Trace. That's the Natchez Trace. This is, if you've ever been there, it's really, it's a marvelously beautiful thing. It was just a trail. It was a highway, but it was, there would have been wagon ruts in that time. But this is what it looks like today. Part of the controversy here it seems to be that some folks are saying it was safe to travel the Natchez Trace, and others are saying, oh, it was ruffians all over, and it was terrible, and you had to be armed to the teeth to, to travel. What's your take on that? Well, John Geis, who will be part of this story, the, the, he's, the, he's the most prominent of the murder theorists, he, has, he wrote books on the Natchez Trace, and he says it was notoriously um, full of bandits and robbers and pirates and ruffians, and that even a governor with who was a great shot, heavily armed, would have been in some danger traveling in a small party on that road. There's my mother on the Natchez Trace. Lewis again. That's the ceremony. and um, It was really a very moving ceremony, Larry, uh, last year. Uh, they gave Lewis sort of full burial ceremony. Uh, Masons from a number of states participated. David Borlaug represented the state of North Dakota. Uh, it was really an extraordinary event. It was the last event of the bicentennial, and it was at that site. This is John Geis, who is the, I think he's at Hattiesburg, the University of Southern Mississippi. You know him. You've worked in similar fields with him. He's the most prominent national exponent of the murder theory. Uh, but don't be fooled. <laughs> and then this is James Holmberg. Who is, he's, the, he's the curator at the Filson Club in Louisville. He's the one who discovered the 55 Clark letters uh, that have really changed a lot of our thinking about Lewis and Clark. He's in this book. Um, the last two pictures that you saw, those are the principal authors, in addition to Clay Jenkinson, that have written in, uh, their positions on by his own hand. So this is Holmberg. Who's, he's a murder theorist. He's the most prominent, or one of the most prominent of the mur murder theorists. Geis is the most prominent. I mean, uh, he's a suicide man, Holmberg, and, and Geis is a murder theorist. That, and then one more slide, that's Stephanie Ambrose Tubbs, Stephen's daughter there. This is the broken shaft representing Lewis's uh, broken life. Again, again the trace. And this is the book that if you're interested in this subject, you should read. Okay, so where are we? I think we ought to, let's go back then to Let's back up a little bit. Where are you trying just, to go? I, I just want to put the cabin up here. Let's talk okay. about what happened that night. We okay. haven't gotten into the details of, of what happened that night. Let's talk about him. He rides in and... He comes in alone. Mrs. Grinder is a little freaked out, but she makes space for him. He has supper. Um, he takes a little bit of whiskey, but not much. He strolls back and forth restlessly to the door. She hears him mumbling and sort of going through arguments as if he's talking, and it has to do with the government and his vouchers, but she can hear him sort of rehearsing maybe what he's going to say when he gets to Washington. He's odd, but he's not crazy that night, and eventually um, he goes to bed, and she's then with servants and others in outbuildings, and she's maybe a hundred yards or fifty yards away from the cabin where Lewis is staying alone. His servant has now come up and Neely has come up there staying in outbuilding. So the governor's alone in this cabin and everyone else is somewhere else. It's a dark night and sometime after midnight, this is according to Priscilla Grinder, she hears a shot and then a, a thud and then there's a period of time that elapses and she hears a second shot. And she's, of course, terrified, and she's too frightened to go check it out because her husband is somewhere else. So then after a while, Lewis comes up to where she's staying. He's crawled. He's, he's now gravely stricken and, and will die, but he's still very much alive, and he crawls over to the building where she's staying and scratches on the door and begs for water, and she's too frightened to open the door. And then he crawls out to a tree and finds a bucket and he scrapes it looking for water and there is none and then he dies underneath this tree. That's, that's what we know. Um, not to correct you, old great scholar. 
but I think he, when the servants show up, he's back in his bed. He goes back and forth. He's in the bed for a while. Uh, he's under the tree. Because uh, I know when, when you read the testimony there, they say that they came in and he lifted, they, he lifted up he the showed, blanket. He lifted the blanket and showed them his wounds. And, and, and dies there. And he, and he, says, I, he says to Pernier, his free black servant, I have done the business, my good servant. Please get me some water. Okay, and then there's, uh, there were comments about that at one point he took a knife and was slicing his arms. Well, he says to Pernier, I think, it is so hard to die. You know, Lewis is a, is a man of unbelievable physical strength. On the journey, you notice that Lewis, even when he's sick, which he is from time to time, is an iron man. Clark is a much frailer physical specimen, I'm sure much stronger than any of us, but, but Clark is frequently ill and incapacitated and talks about it in the journals. Lewis is an iron man. And at one point when they kill a grizzly bear and they put 13 bullets into it, Lewis says, and I quote, their being so hard to die rather intimidates us all. So now on the last night of his life, Mrs. Grinder or Pernier heard him say, Madam, it is so hard to die. And so he shot himself in the head in the abdomen, and he's still alive. And reports now begin to vary, as you know, but some of the people, who, and none of these are eyewitnesses, say that he was cutting himself with his razor, too. So now the mysteries start to heap up, don't they? I mean, what's the, what's the obvious mystery here? Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look at the suicide. Okay. Because it's suicide or it's murder. Okay. It's, we know it's a violent gunshot death. Right, with a piece of a skull missing and then the fatal wound really is... It's the is abdominal the ab wound. Right. right, okay. So we know he's been shot. Now, he here's the problem, I guess. Number one is, and you've already talked a little bit about this, there's no eyewitness. No eyewitness. Nobody saw Lewis, which is probably not unusual in a suicide. Right. Right? Okay. There's no note. Left no suicide note that we have. There's this key letter to Clark we'll come back to, but there's no... He didn't sit down that night and write out a note. Right. And... There's two shots. And the first one to the head. Yeah. That causes a lot of mystery because people, when I, when I have these lectures, and David Borlaug can vouch for this, wherever we go, people will say, well, here's this great rifleman. One, you know, Lewis was maybe the, one of the best shots of anybody on the expedition. He was an extraordinary rifleman. So it's, how do you not shoot yourself in the head if you want to? I mean, people are perplexed that he could miss. And even, I mean, the, the accounts vary, but they all say that he, he did hit himself. So keep in mind, Lewis, and I don't know the first thing about guns, but I'm just... But these are long. They're these long. So this is a horse long. pistol. So, you mean, it's not like a snub nose something. Right. Lewis has to turn this gun and shoot himself with it. That's going to be quite hard, and that, maybe that explains some of this. But he has two pistols, and they're single shot. They don't, they don't repeat. So he, somehow he gets a pistol aimed at his head and shoots it, presumably, and it, not to get too grotesque here, but it, it shot off part of his skull. But according to the near eyewitnesses, it didn't kill him. It exposed his brains, but it didn't go through the heart of the brain and didn't kill him. So now he has a very severe head wound, but he's not dead. Now whether he would have lived, who knows. So then after a while, Mrs. Grinder says there's a long... <laughs> You can imagine that after that, it took him a while to get back up on his knees or whatever, but then a, a while later, she hears a second shot. So the, it's now the second pistol, and presumably he's put that against his abdomen, and that's the, the shot that kills him. So a lot of people who know more about weapons than I do say, this doesn't sound right. Misses with the first shot, but somehow has enough strength to make a second shot. How do you shoot off part of your skull and had the strength or the capacity or the wits about you to make the second shot. Okay. And what do you think? Well, I don't have an answer to that. I don't think anybody does. Uh, but, but it's I, not, but, but I have read but, enough literature but, to know that people sometimes do miss when trying to shoot themselves right. in the head, and they sometimes do knock part of their head off. Yeah. But I mean, do they shoot themselves a second time? I mean, that, that becomes part of the mystery, right? Okay. But I think what's more interesting here is the reaction of those that knew him. So right, so right, let's away, just, this, right away, everybody says at the cabin that the governor has committed suicide. Everybody who was the near eyewitness immediately assumes that he 
committed suicide. There's not a single person who says, who killed him? Everybody just accepts that it was a suicide. Okay, so now we've got, now the letters start and the reports go to the president, they go to William Clark, they go to the family. So what are their reactions? And this is the amazing thing. So Neely writes to Jefferson. Clark hears about it through the newspapers. But all of Lewis's closest friends and associates in St. Louis, in Washington, and in Kentucky, when they hear the news, immediately say, I'm shocked, but I'm not surprised. Jefferson says, that's too bad, but not unexpected, essentially. Clark says, and the letter that was unearthed by James Holmberg says, I fear, oh, I fear that the great weight of his mind has overcome him. I mean, all of his closest associates in the world, Pernier, Clark, Jefferson, Amos Stoddard, Gilbert Russell, you go down the line, every one of them said, it's a pity, but I don't doubt that it's true. There wasn't a single person in the era of Meriwether Lewis who ever said, this can't be true, or there's more to this story than we know. Everyone was... Um, everyone accepted that Lewis had committed suicide without a single vote of dissent. Okay, and on that point now, let's go back to that letter, the September 11th letter. So William Clark says, well, yeah, doesn't surprise me because... Clark writes to his brother Jonathan and he says, you know that letter that Lewis sent that we both have read and that it's on your desk somewhere? Save that, that's a key document. That, he doesn't go, he doesn't say that explains it and he doesn't say that's his suicide letter, but he says that's I now realize that that's a key document. And so that's as close as we will ever have to a suicide letter, and it disappeared. It's disappeared from history. Whether it was deliberately suppressed, or whether it's, you know, lots of documents just disappear, we don't know, but no one has ever found it. And so if we could find that letter, that letter would certainly be useful because Clark regarded it as essential. Okay, and you have a theory on this letter. Well, every, you know, you have to assume what's in the letter. I doubt that he said I'm going to commit suicide next week at a lonely inn somewhere, but... Um, so what did he say? Well, here's what I think he said. Lewis was... He had lots of problems, physical, attitudinal, mental. He was, he was bankrupt, he couldn't get a wife. I mean, his life was falling apart. But here's what really upset him. Here's what really had him who sent him over the edge. It's the letter he received on August 18th from William Eustis, the Secretary of War, the Robert Gates of his time, saying, your vouchers are unacceptable. We're, we're not only challenging them, but we're, we're not paying them. And he goes on in no uncertain terms to lecture Lewis about the shoddiness of his accounts and, of, and his unilateral decision making and that there's even a conflict of interest between his government work and his commercial work. And, it's a very, very profoundly rebuking letter from the Secretary of War. And it leaves Lewis no ground of doubt. It doesn't say, I'm sure you can clear this up, or maybe, we, maybe we're overreacting. It is a rebuke of the strongest sort from the Secretary of War. And then at the end of the letter, Eustace says, and by the way, I've shown this to the President, James Madison, and he agrees with everything in the letter. So now, you know, think of that. Eustace is saying, lest you think that you can challenge me, this goes all the way to the desk of the President of the United States. I believe strongly that that letter is what precipitated the events that led to Lewis's suicide, because his integrity has been called into question, his honor has been called into question, he's been accused of conflict of interest and, and lining his own pocket from government funds, and I think that what he said in the letter was something like, to Clark, he said something like, they're wrong, I can prove that they're wrong, but how dare these people challenge me? Whatever else is true, these would be errors of the heart and not of the head. Uh, this effectively destroys my sense of myself because these people should not have, they, they might have been upset with me, but they should not have gone thus far, and I think he said something like this towards the end of the letter. It would be better if I, if I just put an end to my own life rather than give my enemies the pleasure of doing it for me. 
And you'll see that he says something very similar to that in another letter. So that's the smoking gun. I think that that that's said. what the letter didn't say, I'm going to kill myself. I think it said, my life is not worth living anymore, and, my, and I have been bottomed out, and how dare they do this, and even though I'm going to prove to them that I was a good man, uh, you, you don't recover from something like this. Okay. So 19, or excuse me, 1810, 1811, 1812, anybody saying murder? Nobody. In fact, one, one quick point, Alexander Wilson, his friend, a dear friend of Lewis, has traveled all the way from Philadelphia down to the gravesite to investigate. That's a long journey to make in 1810. Comes all the way from Philadelphia, he's on, a, he's on an ornithological trip through the United States, but he detours to go to this place and he interviews Mr. and Mrs. Grinder, and he comes away without doubt believing that it was suicide. No part of him thinks there's something fishy here. Okay. And he gave Grinder some money to keep the grave up and so on. What was the condition of the grave when he got The grave had been disturbed by hogs. And bones were? Well, it was all scattered about, and there were weeds. And so he said, you need to, you need to take care of this grave. Here's money to do it. OK. And then, uh, so where, why all of a sudden are we sitting here having a topic of murder or suicide if, in a, if all his contemporaries believe that he committed suicide? So well, how does this become an issue? Well, first of all, let me say that to this. You've read this literature now. Um, tell me if I'm exaggerating. There is no contemporary who thought it was murder, that everyone assumed that it was suicide, that there, there, isn't a, there isn't a hint in any direction in the lifetime of Jefferson, William Clark, or Meriwether Lewis that this was anything but a suicide, right? I agree. So, I mean, if, you could, if you're a historian, which you are, you scour the records and you look for clues, if, as a historian, uh, what would you say at this point? Well, there's no mystery until 1848, I think. 1843. 43, Meriwether Lewis Clark. Well, actually, in 1843, Tennessee decided to name a county after Lewis. So they're going to carve a Lewis County out of another county in honor of Lewis. And then in 1848, a committee decided they needed to put up a proper monument to Lewis. And at that time, they said, you know, it's always been assumed that he committed suicide, but we sort of think maybe he was murdered. And that's it. They didn't offer evidence or anything else. They just said, we kind of think it was murder. And that's the whole basis of the murder theory. I mean, there is absolutely no evidence then or before, but on the basis of that statement in 1848 and a grandson of Clark's who had written saying, ah, there must be something fishy about this. This whole edifice of the murder theory got started. Okay. And today, and David Borlaug can tell you, it has literally taken over the discourse. When we were at the annual conference in Mississippi, I moderated this panel, and we had about 400 people in the room. And afterwards, I said, all right, you've heard from the murder people, and you've heard from the suicide people. How many of you think that Lewis committed suicide? And in this room, about 40 or 50 people tentatively raised their hand. And then we said, well, how many of you think he was murdered? And I didn't say, you know, even though there's no evidence of any sort, <laughs> but, but how many of you think he was murdered? And the vast majority of people raised their hands, some of them both hands. And you think, well, wait a minute. I mean, I'm willing to believe, for example, we were talking before we started, I'm willing to believe that there's some mystery left about John Kennedy's assassination, that that's a debate worth having. But this, as a, as a historian and a humanities scholar, I don't see any basis for ongoing debate about this. It seems like an open and shut case, except that we don't have an eyewitness. Mm -hmm. And there's the problem of two the shots. second gun. Yeah, two shots. Um, let's spend a little time talking about, uh, so let's just, okay, from 1810 to 1848, mid-1840s, the assumption is that he's committed suicide. All of his best friends said that he committed suicide. No one doubted it. No one doubted it. And you have, uh, and you've done a wonderful job in the book on the character of Meriwether Lewis talking about this issue. And so I'd like you to share with us your ideas about what makes you so convinced from sort of an intellectual psychological point of view that, it, that he seems like a good candidate for murder and that it makes, for suicide. excuse me, suicide. <laughs> and, and that it just makes good sense. Okay, well, so far we've been looking at the facts on the ground, as we like to say these days. This is what happened. Two shots, uh, no eyewitnesses, died on such and such a day, everyone assumed it was suicide, and so on. That's just the, I think we've, we've accurately described the factual basis of this. So then in the mid-19th century, the murder theory starts. So now, 
you have that issue. It's kind of a historical document and forensics issue. And as you know, there are people that want to dig up the remains of Lewis to do forensics tests to determine powder burns and entrance and exit wounds and the sort of stuff that you're familiar with from the Kennedy assassination. They've been stymied so far, but if they had the chance, they would dig up the body and do tests, and presumably it would help in some way to settle this mystery. So there's that. But then, so let's leave that whole ground for the moment. Now let's, let's step back and then look at Lewis and ask ourselves, is he the kind of person who might commit suicide? And, and let me say when we start this discussion, you know, some of it, it's, it's a gruesome subject and suicide is always a horrible thing and I know people, I, my life has been touched by suicide, other people's, this is not a laughing matter and suicide is almost always a profound mystery. You know, even if someone leaves a note and says, I can't believe that my boyfriend left me or whatever, it's always deeper and more, it's dense it's, and it's mysterious and it's troubling and it troubles the whole community and everyone around it. And so I don't want to make any light of this story. But, but if you look at Lewis and ask yourself, what about Lewis lends itself to suicide? You know, if you think of how highly strung he was, how easily enraged he is, how, how fragile his sense of himself is, um, how how ill he was, both physically and, and mentally at the time of, of his death. Passages from the journals where he's incredibly hard on himself, including the famous birthday meditation of 18.5 where he says, basically, I've wasted my life. In other words, the circumstantial evidence, the, the evidence of Lewis's character, his activities, his utterances, his responses, adds up to a person who is very, very, very deeply um, fractured and, and, has, and, and, and is very hard on himself and doesn't have a strong inner stability like Clark. So I would say that. Then there's this scene. When Lewis gets out to the source of the Missouri River, he bestrides the source of the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri River, and then he's meeting with this Camille Wait, and Camille Wait is Chicago Wea's brother, out on the Montana-Idaho line, and there's this famous passage from the journals where Lewis is bringing Camille Wade and a few of the Shoshones to this place where he thinks Clark is going to be. And Clark isn't there. Clark is still back with the boat somewhere else. And Camille Wade thinks that Lewis is leading him into an ambush. He doesn't know if he's white. He doesn't know who he is. He's just a stranger. And Camille Wade, the Shoshone are very skittish people at this point for lots of interesting reasons. And so Camille Wade worries that this guy, this stranger, is not what he says he is, but he's going to lead them into some sort of a horrible ambush. And so Lewis realizes, and this is typical of Lewis's character, he says in the journals, you know, if this fails, if Camille Waite leaves me now, not only will we not get the horses we need to cross the, uh, the, the Rocky Mountains, but the, the expedition will probably collapse. And he's always saying that. If such and such doesn't happen, the expedition could collapse. You know, Clark never once says that. Lewis is the commander. So Lewis is really upset, and he's trying to keep this suspicious, skittish, reluctant Camille Waite with him, and he can't. It looks like he's going to lose him. And so Lewis then says, I did something I never thought I would do. I took off my two-cornered hat and put it on his head, and I gave him my rifle. And then he, Camille Waite, in turn took off his tippet, the one shown here, and put it on my shoulders, because the idea was that if it is an ambush, then the ambushers will think Lewis is Camille Waite, shoot him now, and they'll think that Camille Waite is Lewis and spare him. So they've, they've swapped their basic clothing. And then Lewis says in the journals, and I think it's absolutely the key passage to this story, he says, I looked over at Camille Waite and I looked back at myself and I realized that I had become completely metamorphosed. And so in a sense he's saying, I'm now an Indian. I know, you know, I, I, everything, all the tokens of, of my life as someone representing an industrial enlightenment republic are on this guy. And I'm wearing Indian clothes. He says, I'm, I was dressed like an Indian, I was tanned like an Indian, I looked like an Indian, I slept where Indians slept, I eat what Indians eat. He said, I'm, he basically is saying, I've gone off the edge of my identity and become completely metamorphosed. 
Now, maybe I'm making too much of that passage. I love that passage. And believe me, none of the other journalists would ever use the word metamorphosed. You know, this is a powerful thing for Lewis to say. But what I find so interesting is that he gets back after the successful return, and when he gets to be painted, he has himself painted not as, Jeffer as a Jeffersonian gentleman and not as an army captain, but he has himself painted metamorphosed. So that, that scene, that moment, which is August 17th or 18th, 1805 on the Idaho-Montana border, is, is critically important for Lewis, because otherwise he wouldn't have chosen to be painted in that guise. And so something about that appealed to him, fascinated him, maybe troubled him. But my, I heard a lecture by Barry Lopez, the great Barry Lopez who's written Arctic Dreams and River Notes and Desert Notes and so on. He lives in Oregon. He gave a lecture for a symposium that I organized in Portland. And he is, it was a fabulous lecture. And, and the theme was, how far can you go out and still come back? How far can you venture off the known world and still come back intact. And he said, Lewis went too far. Lewis, Lewis went farther than he could regroup. But Clark went the same distance and regrouped just fine. Mm -hmm. You make a point in your book about looked in too many mirrors uh, uh, on this issue itself. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I'll just tell you a little story that tells you something about that. Um, you know, looking in the mirror of yourself, when, if you've ever been on a long ordeal of any sort, a camping trip or uh, the army or mountaineering or you know, extreme athleticism, whatever it is, when you really test yourself, you get to look at yourself in a way that you don't on a normal Tuesday. And what you see is not always admirable. I remember hearing a report once about an, uh, 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 an Alaska mountaineering thing where something went really wrong and a couple of people died. And the guy who was talking about it said, on a trip like that, you know within two or three hours who everybody really is. Their real selves begin to come out. Their, their social selves are, are shunted away, and you get to find out who's the generous one, who's the selfish one, who's the saint, who's the sinner, and so on. And you learn a lot. And when I was on my little Missouri trip a couple of years ago, when I first moved back to North Dakota, I, I walked from Marmoth up to the North Unit, and you know this was a very pansy sort of trip, but but about the seventh or eighth day, Larry, I had this, I had this, I had this salami, and it was a, it was a Cloverdale tangy sausage, <laughs> and it was my one little, it was like my Wilson, if you've seen Cast Off, Castaway. It was like my, my, it was every, I, every night I would cut myself a little eighth of an inch piece of that salami, and that was my treat, you know. And I would wait all day, and I'd think, oh, it's the hottest summer in North Dakota history, but if I get to my camp, I'm going to open up that sausage. You know? <laughs> so you, that's how you do this. And so that night, I'm sitting around. I'm under these cottonwood trees. It's a perfect August night, and I, and I cut this piece of salami, and I, put, and I wrap up the sausage and put it back in my pack and so on. I look down, and the sausage piece was on a cow pie. <laughs> I had inadvertently put it on a cow pie. And so, uh, with a, I, just, I brushed it off and ate it. <laughs> and it was, of course you do, because you've looked into a mirror and you realize your fastidiousness and your, you know, your civilized life means nothing out there, and there's no way I was going to waste that precious little piece of salami. But you know, if, if, I, if you and I went out after today and went to the bistro or pierogi and they served us something on a cow pie, we would sue them, and we would gag and go to the hospital and never get over it. But when you get out there, you, you take my point, you strip away some of this veneer and the sense of yourself and your uptightness and fastidiousness, and you get into a raw or more crude, more primal, more primate sort of person. And that's good to look in those mirrors. But if you look in those mirrors of who you really are when you're very, very tired and strained and way out beyond your capacity to just get in the car and come home. If you do that, and this was just as I, re as I say again, just a little weeny little trip, but if you do this in a big way, and you look in that mirror, sometimes you see something from which you really can't recover. And I think that's what happened to Lewis. He just, something snapped out there, some sense of himself, some, maybe some understanding of what civilization means, the difference between a savage and a 
civilized man, maybe some sense of, you know, some, his sense of his core identity, whatever it is, I'm 100% convinced that things happened to Lewis on the journey that undid him. That it, this wasn't just a suicide that came up years later out of the blue, that Lewis was a highly fragile, fragmented, self-doubting human being who went on this journey, and the journey didn't make that better, it made it worse. But Clark was a stable, intelligent, productive guy who went on the journey and it made his life better. And so it's really about who you bring to the journey, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna pull Clay Jenkinson here, but in his book, uh, and I love this line, where Clark looked in the mirror and shrugged, and Lewis looked in the mirror and shuddered. It's a great line. Well, it's probably baloney, you know, but, <laughs> but, 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 but it sounds good. But, you, but here's but, the no, point. No, no, I think it's a great line because you and I had uh, on this very stage when, uh, when we talked about uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Same problem. We had the exact same issue because uh, Neil Armstrong shrugged, and went on, had a great life. Gone on from strength still, to strength. Still, yeah. yeah. And Buzz Aldrin goes on Dancing with the Stars. And doing has written the, several books about the nervous breakdown he had when he got back, including one called Return to Earth, where he says, when you bend to the moon, what's left? Yeah. I think that but it doesn't affect everybody like that. No, it, but it, it does affect some, and I think that, the, but here's my point, the qualities that make Lewis so remarkable. When Lewis is keeping his journal, he's the most interesting journal keeper by far. No one ever wished Lewis had written less. Lewis is lyrical, he's philosophical, he's reflective, he's deeply sensitive, he sees things that other people don't see, he can hear bird calls in an extraordinary way. His, he, is, he has enormous capacities to take in life. But there's a d dark side of that, isn't there? Because that means that he's less self, he has less character armor, he's less self-protective, he doesn't have the same detachment that we all need from life. And so things get really deep in. He, in addition, he's a constitutional melancholic, maybe he's manic depressive, maybe he's bipolar, maybe he has Asperger's, we don't know, but he has constitutional issues. And he's self-medicating with alcohol. So he's really creating a cascade of problems instead of making life better for himself. Post-expedition, Lewis is kind of feeding his neuroses with all sorts of crazy behavior. Uh, so let, let's grant that all of his contemporaries believe he committed suicide from your analysis of who he was and his character. Absolutely seems right on. Seems yeah. right on. Uh, Thomas Jefferson thought it was right on. And wrote this in the 1814 first edition of Lewis Clark, wrote unambiguously, he did the deed which plunged his family and his community into affliction. Okay. Now let's just cover one more topic here, and then and I'd like to go to some questions. questions from the audience here, but um, why is it that we, and I don't think it's an American thing, I think it's probably a human thing, and if we're gonna talk about humanists here, um, why is it that we just can't accept, you know, some people can't accept the death of John F. Kennedy, when we all know he was assassinated that day. You know, there's pictures of him supposedly on a Greek island sitting in a wheelchair long after the assassination. People could not accept the fact that uh, Princess Diana died. Uh, there's pictures of her in a wheelchair after the accident. Um, Elvis Presley, like you mentioned, you know, he's seen at gas stations. Uh, um, and, and the list goes on. And, and the fact that we can't accept or some can't accept that Lewis committed suicide, rather it had to be murder. They accept the fact that he died, but it had to be murder instead. What does that say about how we view celebrity or heroes or? Well, we, we don't want to say goodbye to these people. You know, we, I mean, I, uh, I was alive on November 22nd, 1963. I know you were. I think everyone in this room who was alive that day remembers exactly where they were. And we all, I think, feel that the country had went into a, a, a spiral after that and that somehow Camelot is an apt term for something that was intact before and, and has not been intact since. And so there's this sense of, you know, you invest this with emotion and with, with meaning and significant, significance. And so then you, you, don't, you want to be in denial about the key fact that it happened, whether it was a lone gunman or, or more. John Kennedy was martyred on November 22nd, and so the same is true of Elvis at a, at a lower level, but, but profoundly for those for whom this matters. And we don't want to say goodbye, that's one thing. And secondly, 
if, if Neil Armstrong had come back, you know, we don't have an exact analogy, but if Neil Armstrong had come back and three years later he had shot himself at a Motel 6 in Tennessee, we would have, that would be very, very upsetting to us because in the, in the deepest recesses of our understanding, we would say this has to say something about what we were doing. In other words, it's not just a guy whose life went bad. Somehow it, it casts a shadow back on the enterprise, on going to the moon, on the space program, on America's purposes, America's industrial capacities. Similarly with Lewis, it, we all get it that if he, were, if he were murdered by a robber on the Natchez Trace, that's just one of those things. You and I could walk out of here tonight and be struck down by a bread truck, and it would be just one of those things. But if he committed suicide, then what does that call into question? And we don't know the answer to this question, but everyone gets it, that it calls something into question. And it, when it happens, even we take a small example, when, a, when an Olympic athlete then winds up on the cover of a, of a scandal magazine smoking marijuana, it, it casts shadows. These, these shadows are bigger than the immediate. They somehow cast themselves over something larger and more important than what, than, than what they actually mean. And so I think we have a hard time with that. And so we don't want to say goodbye to these people. We don't like what this implies. You know, the Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Jim Morrison, Elvis, that these famous entertainers that were central to the life of a generation were also on a self-destructive course that led all of them to die young. People don't want to face this, I think. And so, they, so they're looking for a port, any port in the storm of the metaphysical angst that this raises. And so if you can just say, well, some guy robbed him for his watch, you just calm down. It's a horrible thing that happened, but it doesn't, question, it doesn't call anything into question except the security of that night. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Well, I think we ought to get some questions. But, well, no, I want, before we do that, what do you think? <laughs> what do you, what, I mean, well, no, I agree with you. I, I think there's, there's a tremendous need in, our, in societies, not just our society, in societies, to two, two issues. One is that, that issue I think you bring up that's very, very good, and that, that is that you don't want to say goodbye. You know, in 1963, we didn't want to say goodbye to, to Jack Kennedy. And I bet you there's people out here, I'm not one of them, that knows the year that Elvis died. 78. Seven? Seven. August. See, 63 12. I've got down, but I don't know 16. when Elvis died. When did Elvis die? There you go. And it's my I, own wife. I know, I know where I was, too. Do you know where you were? <laughs> I have no idea where I was when Elvis okay. died. But at any rate, the point is that, that uh, we don't want to say goodbye to those folks. And I think also, and particularly in Lewis, with the Lewis story, is that there really is an attempt to rationalize irrational acts. And so it makes more sense, as the country grew distance from Lewis, it made more sense. If we want to keep him a hero, then we can't have him scandalized by this irrational act. It makes sense to me, doesn't it right. to you? Sure, it makes. The problem is that facts that are true. stubborn things, yeah. you know? Yeah, that, that when you try to rationalize the irrational acts, which I think with the Lewis case, uh, that that's what society's trying to do, or those that are arguing. And this is a big argument. And Huge. They're trying to, yeah, they're trying to get, uh, you know, they're Dig up the body. disinturn him and do tests on the body, but evidence is there's probably just a few bones left and some buttons. I mean, that's probably all that was buried. You know, they're not gonna find much if they do do that. And, uh, and I don't know if but it's see, but, but, but why does it matter? I the mean, National why? Park Service doesn't want to exhume him for lots of reasons. And I'm, I'm on their side, but, but of course, by refusing to dig up the body, this just fuels the conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. Their view is, well, why not? And I guess they're right in a certain way, but, but this just gives them more certitude that there's something that's not suicide going on under the ground. And if you do it with Lewis, then what's to stop us from doing it with JFK? because we know that he was buried at sea off a Greek island many years after his assassination, right? That's how the story goes. People that believe that he survived, don't look at me that way. People that believe that he survived believe that he was buried. Anybody else have heard that story? Come on, let's show of hands. You're don't alone, Larry. Uh, oh, I saw a hand back there. You're I'm alone, not all alone on this one, honey. I'm not all alone. Um, but your, your but point where is, does it yeah. stop? Well, it where doesn't does it stop? stop. Right, so it is important. Do we have a, uh, a wireless hand? Robin's got, okay, 
we've got time for some questions here, and Robin has a mic. And if anybody has a question for our eminent scholar. Or if you just want to go. You know. <laughs> um, Any thoughts? There's some questions right here. I have two questions. Uh -oh. um, I'm, there's a couple of pieces of, inf of information that I would really like to have at this point. First one is, I want to know how common suicide was at the time that Meriwether Lewis died. Was this a thing that a lot of people did so it wasn't questioned? Okay, that, and then the second question is, um, at the time that they decided to put the monument up, where the original question of murder came to rise, was it because suicide was considered shameful and they don't want to have a monument to uh, someone who did something that was shameful? It would be more honorable to have a monument to someone who was murdered. So I'd love to have those pieces of information. I, I can answer the second question. So yes. can I. Okay, go ahead. You go ahead. No, you, first go. One. No, you did the second. <laughs> okay. On the second question, uh, you know, I was intrigued by that uh, same thought, and uh, in the book, uh, by his own hands, uh, Dr. K. Jameson, who's a, a, a scholar on suicide. At Johns Hopkins. Um, she says that suicide is at odds with a country's notion of what a hero should be. And then secondly, derangement is inconsistent with courage, honor, and accomplishment. So certainly, I think in 1848, when they started talking about putting a monument up, there's going to be people saying, just a minute, you're putting a monument up to somebody that's committed suicide? Is there honor in that? And so absolutely, that, then that's how the murder theory then really gets some legs. But you're gonna answer the first question. Well, there's no answer to the first question that I know of, but, but I can tell you this, that um, suicide was not that distant from Thomas Jefferson. Lewis committed suicide, presumably. Pernier, the free black servant, later committed suicide. Jefferson wrote a letter confirming this about six years later. Um, Jefferson's um, manservant, James Hemings, one of the famous Hemings family, wanted his freedom after he became a chef in France, and Jefferson gave him his freedom in $100 and sent him to Boston or Philadelphia. And a few years later, James Hemings committed suicide. I think suicide was probably, I don't know the answer to this. It was, I'm sure suicide is kind of a constant. It's, it's very rare, but it happens. But it happens in stressed communities more than not, where there's a tremendous amount of suicide on Indian reservations in North Dakota. It's a horrible national scandal that needs to be addressed more completely. Byron Dorgan has done a great job on it. But it's, I think it's a constant, but in, in situations of great strain, it goes up. And of course, the medical system in Jefferson's time was such that people lived in with much higher levels of pain than we have to today. So I'm just guessing that if we could actually determine this, that suicide would be at least as common in his era and probably more. But I don't have any hard evidence except this anecdotal stuff about Jefferson's circle. Okay. Any more questions? Don't. You put together a connection that I wanted you to explore maybe a little further. The Native Americans have a higher rate of suicide, and that picture, um, how do Native Americans back then, how did Native Americans back then view suicide? Was it, would it be better for him to have gone down with a ship? I mean, I know you, you said, Larry, that our culture does not view suicide as honorable, but when the Titanic went down, the theaters in Japan stood up and applauded because the, the captain went down with the ship. So is it our society versus? Well, the first response I would have is a captain going down with a ship is far different than a, than a suicide. I, the honor, the, 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 the honor issue, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we all have seen Shogun, right? Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> Uh, committing Harry Carey, a very honorable thing to do. And so I'm sure that culturally, suicide is viewed very different. I think our Judeo-Christian culture, however, is very strong uh, against suicide. And, you know, we take uh, Dr. Kevorkian, and I'm not defending Dr. Kevorkian, but we put him in prison right. for helping people for assisted suicide. So our society has a very... Was Meriwether Lewis a Christian? No. Uh, Meriwether Lewis was like his patron, Jefferson, a deist. A deist, um, as you probably know, is someone who believes that there is a God, but not a God, not a Christ. That there's a God who set 
Jupiter and Saturn and the sun into motion and a god who created life on Earth, but it's not an interventionist god. There's not, in Jefferson's and Lewis's world, this isn't a god you can pray to. Uh, there's no god to pray to because all you can pray for is god to maintain the solar system. And so Lewis didn't have, there was a part of this lecture that we won't go into, but you know, part of what happens with suicides, and, 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 and Kathleen Jameson, the Johns Hopkins um, psychologist, has a brilliant essay on Lewis in a book called Night Comes Fast about suicide. I'm fascinated by suicide. John Donne, we've talked about on the stage, wrote the first defense of suicide in, the, in, in English literature. St. Augustine, one of the people I've spent a lot of time studying, wrote the, the, the Catholic Church's strictures against suicide. They continue to be a prominent, you know, almost 2,000 years after Augustine. Uh, it's a fascinating subject, but, but the suicide pattern of highly strung people is, uh, is something that, that Kathleen Jameson has looked, uh, has looked at very carefully. And Lewis, she says, Lewis is precisely the kind of person who you would expect to commit suicide. Not that you ever expect anybody, but, but he fits the profile. That it's, she says it's not shocking. It's not, it's, it's not out of the question. You know, everyone says, how could a national hero do this? She says this is, this is actually quite, not typical, but this is, this is something that's within the realm of psychological projection. Did that answer your question or not? I have a lot of questions. No. <laughs> I don't know. Idea. I don't have any I, idea. I have, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't. I don't know that. Don't know that. Any other questions? Oh, Here's we've one. got some questions down front. Well, I want to say thank you for your time and attention. And these questions that go through my mind is that government officials said they weren't gonna honor his vouchers, and that's what put him over the edge. And the questions that go through my mind is, well, maybe they didn't honor his vouchers because he's a drunk, he takes drugs, maybe he is a disreputable person that did squander the funds. You know, maybe we, we've heroized him, and maybe they saw him as someone who might have squandered the funds, not a hero after all. And then another question that goes through my mind is, what would be gained by his murder? Well, if he's a disreputable person, maybe he's going to go spill the beans on another disreputable person on his way to Washington. And that person didn't want that to happen. And then if the uh, people in charge believe he's disreputable, they're not going to uh, put up a controversy over suicide. There's not anybody going to step forward and say, hey, this is a cool guy. He didn't kill himself. They're going to say, sure, he killed himself. He's a disreputable guy. Those are some of the arguments, by the way, that John Geist puts forward in yeah. his article in this book, that, that there, was a cover, there was a de facto cover-up, not that there was a crime that they were covering up, but they all just thought it was easier just to let it's the story easier. stand. In fact, Geist wrote, and I, even, I wrote it down because I couldn't believe he was saying this, but every hour of every day, an official somewhere in the United States is labeling a homicide a suicide because it is the cleanest, easiest decision. So might have Jefferson. You know, but that's just completely wrong. You know, when I, I, I have a newspaper background. David Borlaug has a newspaper background. Newspapers in North Dakota when I was growing up routinely um, fibbed about a suicide. That the, the, there would be a suicide in a town like Rame or, you know, Belfield, and the newspaper would want to print it, and there would be pressure put on the newspaper, or the newspaper would self-censor and say, well, he died of a gunshot accident or whatever. But there was a huge and there has been throughout history. There's a huge preference to label anything but suicide to protect the feelings of the survivors and so on. I, don't, I think Geis is completely off on that. Yeah. And but, on that, I don't want to get myself in trouble here, but I will tell you that on that, uh, it, and I've done some research on the Vietnam War, and <laughs> the bottom line to letters from going home from commanders was if there was any way not to say suicide, any way. And so- Don't they, lie they, openly, but uh, if there's a way to shade it. Yeah, if there's a way to shade this thing so we don't have to say that this GI committed suicide, then we're gonna find a way to do that. And I think that's Geis's point, but, but he- Let me just explain uh, in answer to, to the question what exactly happened about the, 
the finances. The finances. There are two issues on his finances. One is that he wasn't reporting. If he had just sent in the receipts with periodic reports, he could have saved himself all of this trouble. And, and I gave a lecture out in Lewiston at this year's Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage meeting about his silences, and his silences really are one of the key issues in the breakdown of Lewis. Jefferson kept saying, we haven't heard from him. The War Department would say, we haven't heard from him. The publisher said, we haven't heard of anything from him. Everyone worried about where he had gone and why he had gone silent. His silence is probably based on depression and so on, but whatever it is, it was an incredibly bad move on Lewis's part not to keep in communication. If he had been writing to Jefferson regularly, Jefferson would have protected him in the War Department and this wouldn't have happened. If Clark had been with him on October 11, 1809, he would not have committed suicide. I feel absolutely certain. Clark would have got the bottle away from him, taken the gunpowder away, he would have gotten him to bed. <coughs> Clark would have seen him through that. So there are all these kind of these historical things, but here's what exactly happened. It has a North Dakota connection. They tried to get Sheheke, the white coyote, um, Shehegshot, there's a statue of him up in the, at Fort Mandan, they tried to get him home. He had gone off to see Jefferson and go to the east, and now they needed to get him home. Well, the first ex escort that brought him back got turned back down river by the Arikara. The Arikara were in a hostile, angry mood, and a, a, a gunfight occurred between the return party, and Lewis and Clark weren't on it, but some of their men were with Sheheke, and the Arikara turned them back. So they'd gotten all the way from St. Louis to almost to the North Dakota border and they get turned back. So now they still have a problem. They haven't gotten Sheheke home. So then Lewis and Clark and others had formed the Missouri Fur Company. So they, they, they were gonna get rich off of the new fur trade, which is a sort of a conflict of interest. But, but it was acceptable. It was acceptable in that time. Yep. And then they, here's what they decided to do because they needed a force sufficient to get through the Arikara and the Lakota they decided to have a, a public-private partnership where this fur company would send men and the militia and there would be U.S. Army people and that larger group of many, many men, several hundred in fact, would bring up Sheheke and get him past the trouble spots back to the Mandan villages. And, that, and the government agreed to that. The government didn't like this idea very much but they realized you gotta get this guy home. So the, the War Department authorized Lewis to spend $7,000 flat he could, he, could, he could pay the, this Missouri Fur Company $7,000 flat to return Sheheke to North Dakota. Just before that expedition was about to come up, and it did successfully return Sheheke. This is the subject of Tracy Potter's book. Um, just before that expedition left St. Louis, Lewis heard that there was going to be more trouble with the Lakota. And so on his own unilaterally and without consulting with Washington, he added $900 worth of gifts, a $400 voucher and a $500 voucher to buy gifts for the Indians, which would presumably please them and make them less hostile. And so he now had, instead of paying the $7,000 flat fee that had been authorized by the government, Lewis has, without communicating with anybody, made it an $8,000, $7,900 return. And that's what did it. When William Eustace got those vouchers, he said, we're not paying them, you're paying them, because you were given a $7,000 flat fee, and by the way, this was a kind of a stinky thing anyway, because there's this conflict of interest. And we would have thought that in the last couple of years, you would have communicated with us once or twice about your work out there, and so we're not buying it. And so he's fed up with Lewis, and Madison is fed up with Lewis, and Jefferson's right on the edge himself but Jefferson probably would have found a way to forgive him one more time. But that's what did it, and so that Sheheke return is central to this, and if it hadn't been for that conflict of interest, Eustace wouldn't have written that letter, Lewis probably would have lived, and we wouldn't be having this conversation. So there's an interesting North Dakota point to it. There's, yep. This may be a little morbid, but how in that day could they tell which shot came first? How would they know that? <laughs> you said it like it was a well-known fact, and I'm just curious. That's a good question. And I guess Lewis must have told one of the near witnesses that he Jenkinson shot. Jenkinson put it in his book. That's good <laughs> enough for me. No, but it, you know, it's just one of those assumptions that there's. If you read the the, the other book. Everybody just assumes head first, abdomen second, but of course if there were no eyewitnesses, unless Lewis said this, 
I guess we don't know. But uh, you would presume that, I guess you'd presume that you'd shoot yourself in the head thinking that was the only shot that the, the head, who knows? Who knows? Well, did he get an opportunity to talk to somebody after, all, after he shot himself twice? I thought yes. He, He's talk, he, he talks had, to he, the servants. He mumbled out a few sentences. He asked his servant to shoot him. In fact, he asked him to shoot him. To you can have all my personal business. effects if you'll yeah. just shoot me. Just shoot me. I'll forgive you, just shoot me. I have done the deed, madam, now get me some water. I mean, the, the reports vary, but he, there are a number of quotations or near quotations afterwards, but not one of them says, and by the way, it was head first and then abdomen. No. No, I thought there was nobody else there. When you said there were no witnesses, the, I thought you meant... To the deed. To the point of death. No, just to the deed. In his bedroom when the shots... Is there any last fired. thought? There's one over here. Just speak up. We'll repeat it. Good question. The question is, uh, to repeat, why he accepts suicide, but why is it then half a century later that this local group in Tennessee started this rumor that has swept away Lewis and Clark studies? Was it because of patriotic issues, the war in Mexico? I don't know. I think it's well, local the only, pride. The monument is what I see. You're going to put up a monument to somebody and then the discussion, because that's when the letter from uh, Meriwether Lewis Clark surfaces where he's writing to this commission saying something about uh, it's that it was, it was really a homicide and and so I think it's just about putting up a monument. Well it's Garrison Keillor has several really funny monologues about this where Lake Wobegon is going to put up a statue to some Scottish king and they do all the genealogical research and discover that he was a chicken thief or something and <laughs> then they, they have to brazen it out because they've gone too far with it. But I mean, this is not that unusual in human affairs to, to, to try to tough it out when you realize that your hero has, a, has clay feet. So I, don't, I think that it may have to do with national events, but it may be just random, local pride. Let's do one question. I, I think quit. the timing of 1848 is probably coincidental. I would, I would think so, but you don't know that. You, know. you had said, uh, Lewis had contacted his friend Amos Stoddard. Stoddard. And uh, did he ever reply, Amos? Did he ever send any money for Lewis? Yeah, uh, Stoddard did reply. Of course, the letter came after Lewis was dead. Um, Stoddard w was happy to loan him the money, and Stoddard forgave him for not communicating. Uh, but it's not an important letter because it doesn't, it doesn't shed any light on what happened. But a number of letters came to Lewis. And by the way, the War Department, after his death, settled his accounts and did pay all the vouchers. They, he was exonerated in some sense in, in the official record after his death. So was that money paid back to Amos then that he had given? Oh boy, that's a good question. Lots of people were owed money and so uh, Gilbert Russell had loaned money from, at Fort Pickering, $100 and a horse. He, uh, he then sued the estate, not hostily, but to get his, his money back. Uh, James Neely sued the estate a bunch of people sued the estate over a long period of time. It took something like seven or eight years to get this all settled. And in the end, it wiped out all of Lewis's holdings. He was a comparatively rich man in the two years that he lived after the expedition. He had land holdings and he'd gotten a nice compensation package from Congress and his salary and an advance on the book. And so, but when it was all over, when all the creditors came storming in after his death, it wiped him out. Even Jefferson. Uh, sued the estate for some unpaid loans that he had made to Lewis. And so Stoddard got his money, but it was, um, but it was uh, several years later. Oh, okay. There's another question over here. La then let's, let's stop. I think we should. Yeah, this will, we'll let Dan ask the last question. <laughs> Softball, Dan. I uh, won't guarantee that. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we uh, need heroes, so we create them, and then we need to destroy them sometimes. But what I'm really curious about is how does how he died inform your reading of the history? Does that make sense? I mean, you talked uh, about your personal experience uh, out in the wilderness, uh, and I recognize where that's coming from, and I'm real curious, does that make Lewis much more interesting to you? 
Yes. How he died? Uh, well, his whole life. I mean, if Lewis were Clark, I would not be as fascinated because I think Clark is a really interesting man and somebody that's worthy of great admiration and, and very important historically, particularly after the expedition. Um, he signed, I think, one in three or four of every Indian treaty ever signed in the history of the central part of the continent. He's an incredibly important figure, but I don't find him very interesting. I'm not fascinated by him. I'm fascinated by Lewis, and even if Lewis hadn't committed suicide, I'd be fascinated by him because of how there's, a, there's a, this fracture, this complication. It's the same reason one's fascinated by Hamlet and not Horatio. It's, you know, that I like these characters like Oppenheimer and, and Lewis and others who are fractured because I, I, not to get into it, but I do think the human condition is prone to fracturing, but I'm fascinated by this. And then the fact that Lewis committed suicide fascinates me deeply and particularly because it's a mystery. But, you know, the larger question you're asking is what does it, what does it signify? What does it tell us? And, and I, here's what I think, Larry, and it's, I don't want to go into much detail on this because it's probably just stupid, but um, this journey of Lewis and Clark has been made to exemplify America's purposes. In other words, this isn't just like a couple of guys in a car driving across Siberia for fun. This is an official enlightenment, reconnaissance, and sovereignty mission into the heart of the heart of the American West. And America's 19th century purposes, the, what, what could be called the conquest of the continent or the Europeanization of North America is all bound up in this. They're, they're not just traveling, they're traveling with the whole civilization on their shoulders, and Lewis felt it. I think that's part of what did Lewis in, that he had this sense of burden. And Clark is like Canada to Lewis's U.S. I mean, Clark doesn't have that burden because it's not his mission. He's not the friend of Jefferson. So I can get why Lewis felt it in a way that Clark didn't have to. But, but they're exemplars. And, if, and they had lots of troubling experiences, and Lewis particularly. And I do think that Lewis's problem, his problematic foray into the heart of the American West, into Indian country, into wilderness, into places that were owned by other people, uh, weighed in upon him in some important way and destroyed him, helped to destroy him. And that's, that has to cast some kind of a shadow on the enterprise, that this whole 19th century thing that happened, beginning with the Lewis and Clark expedition, which winds up at the Little Bighorn, which we'll be talking about later, and winds up at Sand Creek, and winds up at Wounded Knee, and this, this, is, a, this is a tragedy, a clash of cultures tragedy of major proportions. And you can't look at it without it, it really upsetting you in some important ways. And if, if the first, if the Pathfinders had a problematic journey or at least one of them, that's, I think that's significant. That, that I, mean, I wouldn't make it, you have to be really careful not to exaggerate its weight, but I would never not weigh it because I think it tells us something. And so in other words, I don't think this is just about Lewis. I think this is about us. And we're fortunate, we have Lewis and Clark. So Clark is the ultimate survivor. But look what he survives to do. He survives to dispossess Indians. And Clark later said, in, it's in Foley's book, Clark said later, if I go to hell, it'll be for the Osage Treaty that I concluded in 1808. I mean, he said that. He concluded one in three treaties with Indians, but he said, if I go to hell, it's because of the Osage Treaty that I concluded. Clark was a man of, of emotional maturity and conscience, and I think it bothered him, some of the things he did on behalf of a country he very much believed in and he knew that he had to do it. Lewis, I think, is, a, is another question. I think that the fracturing of Lewis is somehow part and parcel of the story of America and that we need to pay attention to that. So that's, I hope that 
answers the question. I think it's fascinating because I think it, it gets at something deeper to, than the death of a single person. And just so I can get the last word in on this issue, um, Clay and I have disagreed on this. I'm more intrigued by William Clark and Neil Armstrong than I am with Buzz Aldrin and Meriwether Lewis for the very reason that individuals that have attained greatness and yet maintained their, have, have remained well grounded in this life are much more interesting to me. Uh, Meriwether Lewis rails about these bureaucrats that are causing all this trouble for him because he's Meriwether Lewis and so he should be exempt from that sort of scrutiny, right? I think you're laying it on a little, but sure. <laughs> so I'm more intrigued by those that can maintain grounded in, our, in their lives, even though they've obtained greatness. And so we've had this discussion. Well, isn't it but fortunate anyway, that there's room for all sorts of approaches? I mean, that's, right. that's the thing. I mean, most people like Clark better than Lewis, and that's great. And we need Clarks. Boy, do we need Clarks. And I'm guessing if we were both on Dancing with the Stars, you'd survive and I'd get out on the first round. <laughs> But, Can't dance. but you see the point, that it, the, 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 the combination is really fascinating of the, the grounded one and the mercurial one. Don't you find that part of the interest? Yeah, most, no, never mind. <laughs> November 4th, we're going to be talking about Otto von Bismarck here. And I certainly thank all of you for coming today. Uh, you certainly enrich our lives by showing up and showing some interest. Thank you very much for being here.